Welcome to Uptime Spotlight, shining light on wind energy's brightest innovators. This is the progress powering tomorrow. Uh, well, let's get started with the challenge facing wind operators today. Uh, the tricolored bat is in serious trouble and it's creating regulatory risks for the wind industry. Can you walk us through what's happening and why this matters for wind operators? It matters because last fall, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife introduced some uh, voluntary avoidance guidelines for the tricolored bat. Um, this uh, particular bat species population has uh, declined and is um, primarily being affected by two factors. Uh, one being uh, something called a white nose that's affecting many bat species across uh, North America. But the other is for some reason the tricolored bats, and we're still looking at a lot of bat researchers, and I'll leave that to the bat biologists to address more specifically, um, but they are uh, being affected very much by uh, wood turbine mortality. So it's going to be a balance between trying to address bat conservation as well as the needs for energy production, which we all all want from a, a wind farm. And the white nose fungus is a really deadly disease for the tricolored bats. I, I see numbers upwards of 90% mortality rate uh, when that fungus uh, affects them. And that fungus is pretty much exists where they live. It's, it's something hard to, to stop. Yeah, there's been a lot of great research by uh, various universities and Bat Conservation International here in North America trying to understand the nature of the fungus and um, how there might be possibilities to uh, treat uh, bats that are exposed to that fungus. All of that at this point is still very experimental. Um, but that fungus has wiped out many uh, bat hibernacula of various species. You might have had bat hibernacula that had tens of thousands of bats that are literally just down to a few dozen. That's extreme. That's that's uh, that's like wiping out entire populations, entire ecosystems. It's very extreme. Uh, so there's been a lot of monitoring for the progress of this fungus. It was first found in New York a few years ago. It's been slowly migrating uh, towards the West. Um, so you've got the fungus affecting the bats and you've got uh, the demand for more clean energy uh, with wind farms that are also contributing to bat mortality and these poor bat species are suffering from both sides at the moment. It's very serious. So Mona, what are the consequences for wind operators who don't proactively address this sort of dual threat to the white nose syndrome, wind turbines and fungus? Uh, obviously they're gonna be asking wind turbine operators to do something. What does that look like? Yeah, well, right now um, when the, the wind farm operators are going in front of environmental regulators to uh, get their permitting all approved, there's a negotiation that's occurring between balancing the bat species protect protection based on maybe pre-construction uh, present servings for bats and the need for energy production. But as more and more bat species get listed as their populations are declining and they become species of concern, you're gonna have an increase in um, what's called blanket curtailment. Uh, so that typically is looking at a site and um, requiring the operator to pause turbine operation during certain times of the year under certain wind conditions, regardless of whether or not there's actually a bat present in that location. So they're setting up time blocks where you have to slow down the turbines or stop the turbines, basically. Exactly. Where is this happening right now? What part of the U.S.? Yeah, a lot of it is occurring in the Midwest, uh, where there are several already species at risk. Um, the Indiana bat, uh, the northern long ear bat, um, several species have a requirement for pausing turbine operation at those wind farms, um, depending on the locations and whether those species were identified as being potentially in the area during the pre-construction surveys. So we've seen some of these uh, like blanket, like I like the term blanket curtailments in the EU, right? For different, different avian species, different bat species. And you've started to see a lot of solutions pop up over there, but mainly they're, they're driven by regulation, right? So the difference here in the States, I guess, is uh, usually regulation for birds or bats doesn't pop up unless they cross state lines, then it becomes a federal issue. And then the feds will regulate something like that's like the, um, the federal migratory bird act. They weren't, they weren't really monitored or not monitored, regulated at a federal level until, oh, these are crossing state lines. So it's a federal thing. Um, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has, they've put some 
some guidance? Do we see and, and guidance and there's like violations, civil penalties, ESA violations. Do we see actual more regulation coming down the pipeline for this? Um, I suspect that there will. Uh, currently, for instance, with the tricolor bat, it's considered voluntary guidance. Um, but more and more species are getting listed. So you mentioned the EU. In the EU, EU all bat species are protected. Um, but even in North America, outside of the U.S. and Canada, Ontario has proposed new um, guidance for bat species at, at risk that right now has a option, two options. One option is the common approach, which means you're doing blanket curtailment up to seven meters per second during certain times of the year. Or the alternative would be approaches similar to what well life acoustics produces, which is something called acoustically trigger curtailment. And with ATC, we are primarily um, integrating with the wind fire systems and when we detect a bat that meets certain activity levels or criteria, we communicate with that wind farm and say, hey, bats are here, let's let you know that. And then the wind farm can feather those blades and pause operation. Right. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has issued that guidance. It's voluntary at the minute, but it may turn into uh, something you have to do here shortly. And in that guidance, there are three different approaches to dealing with this bad issue, really different uh, scenarios, honestly. But Wildlife Acoustics has developed the SMART system, which addresses all of this. Walk us ha through how the SMART system fits into this regulatory framework. Yeah, sure. Um, under that voluntary guidelines, there is a scenario of blanket curtailment, uh, one of the options. The second option is in algorithmic curtailment. And the US Fish and Wildlife has like, you know, 10 words trying to describe what uh, algorithmic curtailment is, but it's basically looking at uh, historical acoustic data, bad activity on a wind farm, or creating models to predict when turbines should be paused to minimize bat mortality. And the third being uh, what we're calling acoustically triggered curtailment. So basically, uh, we have technology that is uh, constantly listening for Bats. Bats are vocalizing in the ultrasonic range beyond the range of human hearing. Uh, we're the primary manufacturer of bat detectors worldwide. This is our specialty. And we're listening for those bats so that as they're approaching the wind farm, we can signal to the uh, wind turbine systems that the bat is present. And they can then pause or feather their blades to slowly pause operational turbines until we can then lower a flag and say, guess what? It's been 10 minutes, the bats are now gone. Kick up your gears and start all over again. That seems like a much better approach than a blanket curtailment, especially because uh, you know if we're looking in the United States at these 100, 120 turbine wind farms. If you have to shut that whole wind farm down at one time as a blanket curtailment for a few hours a day, or if you, you know, like, I would assume it's like right at dusk or something of that sort, um, that's a lot of revenue loss as well. So if you can shut down just portions of the wind farm where the bats have been detected, that's a big change in operations. That, that's a big revenue change too. It's a big revenue change. In a case study in a turbine in uh, England, uh, we found that if you implemented a blanket curtailment regime, uh, you were pausing operation when bats weren't even present. Um, comparing a like a curtailment approach to an acoustically triggered curtailment approach at that particular turbine, uh, we found that from an energy production perspective, um, you had 10 times less pausing of the turbine with acoustically triggered curtailment as opposed to blanket curtailment. And that translates to dollar, dollars and more energy production with a minimized uh, impact on bat mortality. Okay, that's interesting. So you're listening for the bat noise are you listening on every turbine or are you trying to echo locate bats like bats are echo locating themselves are you using basically a bat-like system to detect bats what how does this work from a system standpoint um uh, it certainly could go on every turbine but it doesn't have to a lot of wind farms especially the larger wind farms are already configured in zones so if you deploy these bat detectors at the turbines that are on the leading front of where a bat biologist thinks the bats are typically gonna migrate through with the current topology on that site, then we would detect the bats 
in those leading turbines and then communicating with the wind systems, turbine systems, they can pause operation for those, uh, for that zone until the bats have flown through, we're all in the clear, there's no more bats, and then just start it. So there's a little bit of bat biology going on here to know where the bats are likely to be, like where are they sleeping when they exit, where are they likely headed to, and is it through the wind farm? And if so, then there's a focused effort on that portion of the wind farm for a curtailment for a certain turbines. Is that the thought process to the smart system? You got it, Alan. Wow, okay, that, that is really interesting because I, a lot of systems that we have seen and we've talked to a, a, a lot of uh, obviously uh, nature protection systems, birds mostly, the way they tend to work is that they try to blanket the whole wind farm, that they don't really get into the flight patterns of the birds too much. It is, hey, our wind farms in a geographic area where there would be birds in your case, bats. But th this is a totally different approach. This is a more focused approach to a, a really a complicated problem. It's definitely a collaboration between the bat biologists that are familiar with the site and the bat species in the area, yeah. the wind farm operator in terms of trying to meet their economics and demands for wind energy, as well as the local regulatories and what their requirements might be for bat protection in that region. Do the wind operators have a bat biologist on staff or on call to help with this? Some of the, some of the larger operators ab absolutely do. They have bat biologists on staff. Others will uh, contract out to uh, many of the leading um, environmental consultants that have whole teams of bat biologists that are familiar with bat behavior and bat flight patterns out of sight. So Wildlife Acoustics works with the bat biologist, doesn't really matter who, but you're gonna be working with someone who knows the local terrain the local bat population, their flight patterns. Is there some research that needs to happen ahead of time from the bat biologist standpoint before you start putting in a smart system to know all these details? Yeah, I would recommend the collection of bat call acoustic data in advance of any kind of system like we're talking about to go live, primarily because you want to reduce the false positives and false negatives. These turbines can do little ultrasonic squeaky systems, squeaky sounds, that, you know, you don't want us saying, hey, there's a bat, and really it's just a sweep from the turbine. So collect the data in advance, fine tune all the alarms. That needs to be done by a bat biologist for familiar with bats at the site. But you guys, as, as, as wildlife acoustics, is that kit that you create as well? Do you have the electronics? Like if someone wants to consult to do these things, is that a service that you provide, The like that, that pre-data collection? So we are a manufacturer primarily. Uh, we certainly want partners globally that have become more and more familiar with our, our solution. Um, but you don't have to be a wildlife acoustics equipment expert uh, to implement a, a smart curtailment implementation with acoustically triggered curtailment. You simply have to uh, be a bat biologist, frankly, and then on the back side of things, be able to communicate with the operational staff at the wind farm so that they understand how the system would integrate. So that, that leads me to an important point here. I wanna, and I'm going to put my I'm a wind operator hat on. Right. So how does what does life look like for me? So say this thing is implemented on my site. Um, one of the big things that always pops up now is cybersecurity, right? So is it connected to the turbines or is it just connected back to the, the remote operations center and then they're notified to shut things down or is it automated? How does that all work? Yeah. So we really just raise a flag. So a flag goes up saying we've detected a bat. It's a bat that maybe meets certain bat calls parameters that might indicate a kind of species because in Europe, again, all bats are protected. But in the United States, for instance, we're only looking at particular certain species of bats at the moment with wind farms. And it's met a certain activity threshold. So we're simply raising the flag that that criteria has been met. It's still independently up to the wind farm systems to decide, maybe based on wind speed, temperature, um, time of year, as to whether or not to actually implement the curtailment regime. So I would say like if I was an, if I was an operator, I'd, have, I'd be in my remote operations center and I'd have a matrix in front of me that says, today is September 21st, uh, or what, oh no, sorry, let's, let's just go with today, August 28th. Today is August 28th and this is the wind speed. I'm getting an alert that this bat is here. You know, at this time I don't have to shut down or I do, then I will command my turbines to feather out and, and stop. 
and or not. And then and then when the, the your system tells me, hey, all clear for the last X amount of time, cool, boom, spin them back up, and we're up and running again. Um, so that being said, does this the system has its does it has its own power and data communications, or does that have to hook up somewhere on site? Yeah, it really depends on the individual operator and what they want for that site. Um, some operators will allow our systems to be behind their firewall and fully integrated. Some operators don't want that. Um, and so it's on a different network independent, um, but a way to still communicate with the turbine uh, systems as necessary. And so obviously you're going to run into some pushback from wind turbine operators because anytime you want to put a system onto the wind turbine, just like Joel was speaking to, it's cybersecurity. How do I do this? It's it's always too much, right? I mean, there's, there's, they have a lot on their plate, honestly. So they, they tend not to want to do things, but it is a smart decision. I think at some point the wind operators are going to do it. I think the issue right at the moment is how do they get some information and get started and learn about it? So for advice for those wind turbine operators that are still on the fence about implementing some sort of acoustic curtailment technology, what advice do you give them? Absolutely. Um, I would suggest to, to contact Wildlife Acoustics if they're specifically interested in acoustically triggered curtailment. But certainly, these wind farm operators had to have worked with bat biologists as part of their permitting process. So those uh, teams might be already familiar with the bats and the landscape. Talk with them about the various options that are out there to get ahead of the curve before regulatory changes occur. Joel, we've got to get a bat biologist on because this sounds really fascinating. There's a lot happening in the bat world. Usually we're in the bird world, but in the bat world, we haven't had that much knowledge. This is great. Well, if for Mona, for our listeners that want to uh, find out more about wildlife acoustics and the smart system, where do they go? Uh, wildlifeacoustics.com. And we've got a, under our products, there is a, a, a page dedicated to smart. Mm, and if they want to find you, where do they find you? Ah, I'm not LinkedIn, so reach out for me, Mona Doss with Wildlife Acoustics. Mona, it has been great to have you on the podcast. I learned a ton. I did a lot of research before we started this podcast. Very interesting area. And we need to stay in touch because as things progress with uh, the bats in the United States and in Europe and around the world, we, we want to stay abreast of what the latest technology is. So, Mona, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the time. 